This uh, uh, presentation is based on a book, uh, a new book called Sand and Blood by uh, John Carlos Frey. It's, um, I picked it because it's, it's a good summation of, uh, oh, I would say, probably the last 70 years of uh, things at the border, especially um, uh, more so maybe the last 20 years. And um, I think all of us have seen the uh, photographs and the stories of the horrific things of the children being held in cages and separated from their parents and all of that. And, uh, and then the smoke screen that Trump and his people have tried to put out to cover their tracks from a policy of in intentional cruelty, uh, trying to blame Obama for starting the whole thing when Obama set up these detention centers for the exact opposite reason, uh, which we'll get into later. But in any case, he's written this book, Sand and Blood, and um, it really gives a much better framework for people who want to uh, do work around this issue or go down to the border uh, themselves and lend a hand or organize uh, any kinds of protests and opposition to it or carry out into uh, educationals of their own using uh, this PowerPoint, which is, will be uh, is available on the uh, online university of the left. So I'll we'll start by telling you a little about uh, John Carlos Frey. He was born in Tijuana. He grew up in San Diego. His parents were uh, both American citizens. And the pictures over there are and part of the border area where he grew up on, where he played as a child. And uh, the thing about the border uh, at that time was it, it was much more relaxed. Uh, people knew where the border was, but they were able to, uh, young people were able to go out and intermingle and uh, cross, cross the lines, get across the fences, or even the beaches, and, um, and socialize. Um, and uh, it wasn't uh, considered uh, much of a big deal. But uh, one night he was, he was uh, walking home with his mom, about 12 years old, and his uh, border patrol arrested his mother and took her. She said she had her uh, papers, but she just didn't have them with her. And uh, she could go home and get them if she wanted the one, but they, they just took her and busted her. So her father, his father, I should say, um, figured out what had happened and got the green card. And um, anyway, Frey um, concluded that the main reason it was her mother's skin was too dark. And that's why that's why they uh, took her that way and didn't allow her any explanations. Anyway, it left an indelible impression upon him uh, as a young 12-year-old and uh, did a lot to sort of set him off in trying to understand what was going on. So we should start by saying uh, that the anti-immigration is uh, nothing new in American history. It goes uh, all the way back to the beginning of different people being anti-immigrants of different types at different times. Uh, we know about the no nothing parties it was a nativist party. It was mainly directed at Catholics, Catholic immigrants. The Chinese uh, were specifically targeted and especially harshly with the Exclusion Act passed in 1882. But apart from that, up until 1924, there were virtually no laws around immigration one way or another. If you came here and you were willing to work, uh, uh, that was all you had to do was show up. and. Um, and uh, they usually recorded the fact that you entered the country, although not always. And uh, But there wasn't any hassle about it, like I said, except for the Chinese. So prior to the 1924 and the founding of the Border Patrol, uh, Mexicans, Mexicans crossed the border freely back and forth. Uh, but after the 1920 laws, you know, they were forced to strip and uh, sprayed with delousing gas. And uh, if they crossed every day, they would be gassed every day, men as well as women. And uh, so, so this, uh, these laws and this treatment were racist from uh, day one. So 
Let's talk a little about World War II and the Bracero program. So you see here by the uh, poster, the colored one here, all Americans, let's fight for victory. And it's in two languages. And uh, you have the Uncle Sam's hat and Mex Mexican sombrero. Well, this was uh, by all Americans here, they were using it in the, in the more generic sense of meeting not only uh, uh, people of the United States, but also people of Mexico. They were trying to appeal to a broader unity, mainly because the war uh, had uh, created, you know, immense labor uh, demands, and um, and uh, there was a tremendous need for up to four million uh, Mexicans came into the country between 1942 and 1964, and many of them settled uh, and uh, raised their families here even though their, their pay was low and their, their um, working conditions were abusive. But in um, the 1950s, in Eisenhower, under, under the pressure of uh, uh, labor, labor and uh, some other uh, uh, forces in the country, began to, to try to move the immigrants out. And uh, he moved uh, several, a million, uh, more than a million of them. And, uh, but there were counter pressures as well. Uh, a lot of businesses needed the uh, Mexican American farm workers to uh, harvest their crops. And by 1986, Reagan was uh, signed an amnesty bill that allowed uh, three million Mexican workers to stay. But there were still um, a lot of tough restrictions. Here you see pictures of the braceros working in the fields and. Here, there being a picture of them being hoarded back, uh, herded back and forth on buses across the border um, without uh, much say so in the matter. So, Frey goes on to uh, describe uh, some of the things leading up to the present. He begins by talking about uh, this picture over here on the, um, on the far right upper right. This is called Smuggler's Gulch, and it's, a, it's a, not too far from San Diego. And It's one of the areas where if they put up fencing, people just went around it and they came up and they traveled through um, uh, Smuggler's Gulch here, and uh, they managed to make their way in the country anyway. But even more important is these uh, two pictures, the graph and the picture here on the left about corn. One of the reasons why so many Mexicans wanted to come to work uh, in the U.S. And the, the chart shows you the gradual increase in the amount of U.S. corn exported to Mexico. And uh, it's important not only in tons, but in the fact that the price of uh, corn in Me uh, corn is set uh, at the Board of Trade in Chicago, and it's set at a price less than what it costs to produce it here in the United States. And uh, you say, well, how can a farmer make make money when this corn is priced less than it costs to produce it? Well, the answer is farm subsidies from the federal government. So that's how farmers can make a profit, even though their corn is priced at less than what it costs to produce it. But when the excess is dumped into Mexico, uh, as you can see how it's done here. And uh, you understand the reason why Mexican farmers, no matter how hard they work, uh, or even if they have modern equipment, are not going to be able to compete. So this is one of the reasons why Mexico City is one of the largest city in the world, because the rural corn farming peasantry of Mexico has been uh, driven out uh, by U.S. Uh, food for peace programs and things like that. And so they head for the major cities where their kids sell chiclets on the streets or uh, people are desperate for work. And usually what happens is the young men uh, head north and um, uh, cross the border illegally to become uh, uh, migrant workers, undocumented workers. So that's, that's a key important fact of the economic fact of, of um, why uh, why 
Mexican labor so uh, much needed in the United States and why uh, it's a point of necessity that why they can't grow corn for themselves in Mexico, at least uh, not enough to really make a living on. So once they started to try and toughen up the borders, and we're talking about the 1990s now, uh, around the time that Clinton's in power, they begin to want to, Clinton begins to argue that we had to strengthen the border some around San Diego and, and different places and set up different uh, ways of determining who's crossing the border and when. So they add some fencing to it. They put some additional wire on it. But the main thing that they did was that they contacted this form, Sandia. Sandia was a, a giant defense industry laboratory. That It started building nuclear weapons, but it vastly diversified. And when I understand that nuclear weapons weren't necessarily the only thing. So they, uh, they specialized also in electronic border protective walls and sensors, which you can see here uh, up on the left. And uh, so Project Hold the Line was basically secured San Diego and other urban crossing areas. They didn't go out into the country so much, but the idea was that they set up these, uh, uh, these, um, you know, these fences that were wired with all these detections and sensors around the different cities. But basically all it meant was what you see here in the bottom pictures is uh, people walked around them. They went out into the more rural areas. The one uh, effect of it was that people began to die when they took these uh, remote areas. Maybe they were unhealthy to begin with, or they ran out of water, or some other thing caught up with them, and uh, they weren't able to survive the journey. So we begin to see this, uh, you know, this taking place under Clinton. And what happens is that there's a, a growing border drama and a division in the country itself. And uh, it's summed up in a chapter he talks about it in a, in a tale, tale of two brothers. These are the Hunter brothers. And um, uh, they ended up on opposite sides. Now, John Hunter's on the left and Duncan on the right. Uh, they started with uh, similar views. They were worried ab about drugs and criminals crossing the border, but they didn't worry too much about uh, those who came here to work. But Duncan, on the right, he became a sort of um, uh, hard right. Um, oh, see, oh, this? oh, he's the, he's the uh, you know, yeah, on the right. He became a hard right GOP congressman. And he started pressing for more and more severe measures on the border. And he also violated the rules on campaign money and, and slandered his rivals as terrorists. That's on the lower right. So he gets, he gets caught up as of being corrupt. Uh, so here you have a corrupt uh, right-wing Republican congressman uh, trying to make hay by using a lot of demagogy around the border. Uh, so that's sort of one trend. And here's his brother over here, his brother John, on the other hand. Um, he uh, studied the impact of what his brother was doing and saw it leading to thousands of people dying. And so he uh, built an organization uh, basically to leave water and food for migrants that were exhausted in, in uh, desert terrain. And uh, so he recruited, well, he did this not only himself, but he recruited hundreds and hundreds of different church mainly church-related groups to do this. And uh, they were, you know, sort of angels of mercy who would leave these, leave these things out in the desert so that those making those treks through the wilderness would, uh, you know, would not die unnecessarily. So that sort of, you know, sums up two different attitudes towards immigration, sort of harsh right-wing nationalism on one hand and a, and a more progressive... Uh, humanitarian view on the other. There's a, there two different main trends of thought that exist, exist among Americans today. And he uh, explains this with this a very interesting story, these two, two people in the same family. So one thing that 
uh, Clinton uh, did in addition to all the uh, high tech uh, uh, equipment in the military industrial complex is he begins to militarize the border by bringing the military uh, to the border region. And when, when we talk about the military at the border, we have to take note of a number of different things. One is the, the Posse Comitatus Act. And this was passed long, long back in the 1800s. But one thing about it is it, can, it forbids U.S. soldiers from police duties inside the U.S. Uh, and one of the... Uh, one of the positive reasons for doing this, I mean, the Posse Comitatus Act, some of them originally was reactionary, it was, was uh, to prevent troops from defending blacks in the South in the Reconstruction era. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, uh, one of the positive acts of it, points of it is it, was that the US military is not trained to do uh, police work. Or, uh, their, their job is uh, to kill and destroy, you know, kill people and break stuff is the way they sum it up in army boot camp. <laughs> That's what just the role of a soldier is to do. It's not necessarily uh, working with civilians to do law enforcement. So they're not very well equipped to do it. And um, the part of the story is uh, the, the first group of Marines sent there, by, it was called uh, JTF, Joint Task Force 6. It was about the Marines. Uh, sent for border duty. Here's a picture of one of them. And um, this guy here, it's a, it's a picture of uh, Escal Mirandez. He's a, uh, this, is, this is a young guy up in the upper left-hand quarter here. He was a teenage uh, U.S. citizen, and, uh, and um, he was a goat herder. He had a job herding his family's goats. And uh, every evening, he took him down to the Rio Grande to water, water them. He carried a, a 22 rifle with him in case he ran into any snakes or coyotes or anything else that might harm his goats. Uh, but um, he was doing this one night and he was spotted by uh, this young guy here in the lower picture, um, a, a Marine, uh, Clemente uh, Banuelos. And um, all the um, Marines were hyped up about drug dealers and all sorts of evildoers that were on the borders. Uh, and so the, uh, when they spotted him with the, uh, with the, among his goats, and it was at dusk, they couldn't see that well, but they could see enough to see that he had a rifle. So they shot him and killed him. Um, and, uh, you know, the community naturally was quite outraged. And so a Texas grand jury eventually let the soldier off. But the U.S. government had to pay Hernandez's family $1.9 And for a, a temporary period, armed missions on the borders were stopped, uh, at least for a short time. Uh, that gives you an indication of what some of the, some of the problems are with uh, putting uh, military personnel on, on the border. So 9-11 starts to change everything. And um, a lot of fear mongering starts. There was, uh, here's a, a quote from uh, a congressman uh, and border patrol chief. That's a, his name is Sylvester Reyes uh, up here, this picture of him up here in the upper left. And he says there was no terrorist threat from Mexico and there never has been. The truth was simply ignored, and the militarization of the border rapidly uh, doubled and, and tripled. So here you see your ICE agents, uh, some of them plain clothes, uh, some of them uh, looking like, um, you know, armored tanks on feet, uh, patrolling all sorts of different ways here. These ones are in the New York City subway, others are along in different places along the border. So now the border police are over 60,000 people, and it's the largest police force in the U.S., with a budget over 13 billion and rising. Nearly all the immigrants crossing the border around this time, some 93 percent, are Mexican, and the rest came from uh, Central American countries and um, a few from Asia. None were from the Middle East or terrorists of any sort. 
but still all the hyped up fear of jihadis sneaking across the sand at night uh, allow the feeding frenzy by the military industries now, or now they're taking in billions. And they're still at it. Uh, Trump does this all the time at his rallies. He create, creates these images of Middle East terrorists sneaking across the border, hidden among the caravans of, uh, of uh, Honduran uh, asylum seekers and so on. So now they're going to start spending some really serious uh, money. Uh, a couple of uh, post 9-11, a couple of uh, new new uh, things are passed. The Secure Border Initiative, the Secure uh, and Secure Fence Act, and um, these are supposed to set up along with these uh, fencing. They're supposed to set up these towers. There's a picture of one of them uh, there on the left. Uh, they're SBI, SBI towers, secure border initiative towers. That one's in the Sonora Desert. And uh, Frey went to visit one, and uh, he was taking a look and taking pictures of it, and a, a border patrol guy comes up and asks him what's he doing, and he's saying, you know. And finally, Frey asked him, he says, how, how are they working? The guy says, they're a joke. They never worked, and this is, uh, he says, all of them are a total waste. He says they can't distinguish between heat mirages and real activity. They can't distinguish between human beings and ground squirrels. And that they're, for all their, all their expenses and all the billions put into them, uh, the border guards themselves tell them they're absolutely useless. Um, so, but they continue. <laughs> Up until George W. Bush at one point uh, finally uh, recognizes their failure and sort of quietly set it aside but he counters it by bringing in National Guard troops and thus doubling again uh, the number of manpower on the borders. They also start to really get devious and uh, begin building and uh, fencing and shaping the traffic in such a way that the water or along the border itself is, becomes used as a weapon. Uh, this is a picture of what's called the All-American Canal it's a long canal. It's a bit built to divert the water from the Colorado uh, River to California farms and in order to get into the a place where you might find a job, uh, you have to cross it. Um, and um, it flows very rapidly in places and it's unguarded at night. And the picture here at the bottom, this is a picture of a medical examiner's uh, morgue. Um, Along these, along this waterway, and those were all bodies uh, that they pulled out of the river at the, the different catch basins and so on. Uh, and I get mostly those are still unidentified, and so they're pulling out hundreds of people who were were dying and drowning by trying to cross this this waterway at night, not realizing how dangerous it is or how fast the water is going. And so there's the the end product in terms of the number of deaths um, that uh, that are caused by uh, this sort of thing. So the idea is that they really don't want to do anything to improve the things because they, the idea is that death is a deterrent. And um, so here you see migrants uh, are having more and more difficult. Now they just can't walk around uh, the fences in the major cities, the fences, fences in the, the patrols are reaching out a lot of farther, so they have to go to more and more remote areas and where they don't necessarily uh, have a way. Uh, they can't necessarily make the way by themselves, so they have to hire a coyote. Coyote is, is a, some of them are independent operators, but usually they're people who work for a, uh, a Mexican drug cartel. And the cross and the, the cost of getting you safely across the border ranges, uh, depending on where it's done, it ranges between $2,000 and $5,000. So now here you see a coyote taking uh, some people to a remote area in the picture on the left. This uh, little uh, a picture here on the lower right is in one of the towns where in Mexico. Uh, it's in Altar, Mexico. It's right on the edge of the border. And it's sort of a staging area. 
This is where Fry himself went, because he decided to, to go on one of these trips along with the uh, organized by a cartel, and he paid his money to go along with the other migrants. And he says he, they took him to this little town, and they even have a shop there, sort of a last minute shop, where you can buy survival gear. It's a whole little little cottage industry uh, created. And, um, you know, to be able to uh, get across. But even still, a lot of people die along this route. And up here, you see, um, people from uh, primitive graves are just, you know, remains laying out in the open. These are people trying to gather up remains and put them into body bags. And people can't survive this way. So the cartels justify the costs due to their investment in surveillance equipment to attract the border guards. They have a lot of uh, uh, fancy high-tech equipment and phones and radios. Even in this little town of Altar, Mexico, they have their own helicopters uh, so they can go up and see, uh, you know, what the schedules are, who's guarding, you know, the guards, which guards are taking a break and so on. And so they can radio this back to the coyotes and, and get them across. So that's how they justify their increase in cost. So basically what happens is this formula up here, the more secure the border, the more deaths, and the greater profits uh, made by the cartel. So the more secure you make the border, the only result is that more people die and more profits are made. So it still doesn't curb the overall numbers. So in order to, it's one thing to put military equipment on the border, but it also has to, a certain thing has to be done to militar, uh, to transform the minds of our soldiers to justify uh, the kinds of abuse. I mentioned before how the, the, the one guy was being, um, the one guy, the goat herder was, uh, people were hyped up and uh, shot him because they thought he was a drug dealer. Well, this, this still continued, still continues this kind of hype. So the border guards are trained to see anyone crossing the border as potential terrorists and drug dealers uh, and uh, basically demonize those. And if it's not done officially by their own, by their own um, officers, it's also done by the, uh, by the sort of semi-official or unofficial <laughs> um, militias that show up, the right-wing militias. Uh, so... Um, Here's a case of uh, this this guy here, Carlos Cruz. He's a uh, just a he was just a simple migrant worker, and uh, so here he's caught and he's taken into this facility, and these are a couple of uh, uh, border guards, and um, they're going to tr try to they're going to try to prove that, that he's a see if he's a, really a drug dealer or not. So they t tell him to drink this juice. And if he's a drug dealer, uh, he'll know that the juice is not really juice. It's, uh, it's uh, filled with, saturated with methamphetamine. Uh, but he wasn't a drug dealer. So he says, do you drink this juice? So he took the juice and he drinks it down. And he's dead a few hours later from, uh, because of what the methamphetamine did to his body. And he just killed him. Uh, down here you see, uh, people lining up on different sides of the border, um, uh, different uh, tear gas and whatnot being thrown back to keep people against the, at the border. And sometimes at night, the uh, different cases where the uh, uh, soldiers and uh, patrol guards, are, they can see across the border, especially given their high tech equipment. They can just uh, say in the middle of the night, they can see somebody wandering down the street, say, in, um, in uh, Juarez or Tijuana, they see somebody wandering down the street. And they would just figure, well, he's out there late in the middle of the night. He must be a dope dealer. And just, so they would just shoot him, shoot across the border into Mexico and kill him. Uh, so these are the kinds of incidents. So not only are they actually like this soldier here, you see him, he, he's found these... Uh, uh, survival bottles of water and he's just basically destroying them all uh, so that people will die uh, from thirst but they also 
uh, kill people just by by shooting at them. Well, that, that happens as well. So the war on the border now, is, uh, as we can imagine, is uh, it really picks up to a certain extent when Obama is deporter in chief. Uh, and, uh, you know, Obama uh, had a conflicted uh, relationship uh, uh, with the problems at the border. On one hand, he was the deporter in chief and he deported huge, uh, huge numbers of people. Uh, at the same time, he tried to do a few humane things. And one of the things is that they often would find children wandering by themselves along the border or, you know, in, in the U.S. side of the border and they're just wandering all along without any parents. And, and uh, so he created these uh, centers to take care of these, house these children until they could find their parents. Uh, so these are the same facilities that Trump now says that Obama started it all. But see, uh, Trump used them for the exact opposite reason. And the, children would be together with their parents and he would take seize the children away from their parents and put them in these detention centers, take their parents, put them up elsewhere, bring their parents up for, before a judge and then deport them without their children. And the idea was intentionally to be cruel and, and so that these were they were lost from each other so that this would be a uh, uh, deterrent. Here's a, a a picture down here is an example of uh, you know, new vast facilities. When you because see, some of these prisons are detention centers, are a network of private prisons, and they're owned by ICE and these other uh, uh, military industrial companies. Here's a site of it inside with a huge amount of uh, you know bunk beds holding uh, holding uh, young people, and. Um, um, the idea when you have private prisons, the, the whole logic of a private prison is you want to keep it full. The whole idea of a public prison is you want to keep it empty. <laughs> but, so that's what the whole thing about private prisons. So, so the cost of them today is over $3 billion and they're, they're making like $700 a day per detainee. Uh, so that's... Um, you know, the intense growth that uh, started under Obama, but uh, now really gets uh, exacerbated uh, under Trump. So now we have now beginning to massive detentions leading to abuse and death. And so in 2016 alone, ICE detained over 450,000 people with 40,000 in their private and state prisons on any given day. And these prisons are not only along the border, they're all over the country. Uh, and we have, a, we have our jail here right here in Beaver County has paid $7,000 a month by ICE to handle whatever, uh, whatever people uh, ICE depends to dump, uh, dump there. Um, so the centers you can see here, a picture on the below that are often overcrowded and they lack uh, facilities for hygiene and medical care. You'll find their uh, rooms, uh, packed like these and there'll be one big pot in the center of the room which people are supposed to use as a toilet and uh, that's their sanitary facilities um so up here in the uh, upper right you begin to see there's a resistance growing to this and this never again is now this is a lot of jewish young jewish americans uh, have taken up this case because they they see the fascist dimension of it and they see how this is uh, you know, similar in many ways to the rounding up of the gypsies and eventually the rounding up of the Jews in Germany. And uh, so that's uh, the origin of this, this kind of um, opposition. So Trump has escalated it to a new heights, uh, making cruelty itself a policy. And so however, under just the harsh the border crisis was trump trump is designed to make it only make it only worse he talks about his wall but his wall is really actually pretty much of a joke here's a picture of one you know one of the actually more difficult stretches of wall 
And here's an example of the, you know, the kids getting right over it. It's not very hard. Even 30-foot high wall, all you need to defeat it is a 31-foot ladder. In fact, they do the, the way the kids figured out, they figured out ways to do it without even a ladder. They just get a long piece of rope with a hook on one end and toss it up, and they use the rope to climb up. And then once they're up there, they let down a rope ladder. To, and, uh, so everybody can scamper right over. So the, the wall um, is per, pretty much of a joke. Carl, Raphael had a question. Okay. Uh, in the chat, do you want to say it, Raphael? Or you want me to read it? Okay. Um, uh, I just was wondering whether we have seen any of the materials that are used to uh, train uh, border agents to demonize migrants, um, whether written materials or we, do we know of any particular groups who take on that role? He doesn't mention any particular um, piece of uh, instruction manual or anything like that. He, he just mentions that it happens, but that's an actually a good question. It might be a good research project to find out to see if you can find a paper trail on, uh, on that sort of thing. So anyway, Trump uh, and uh, his Attorney General Sessions came up with what they call zero tolerance. So when Trump says, uh, He's just doing what the Obama did before. And then the, the obvious reply is, well, why then did you have to come up with a new policy called zero tolerance? Um, so zero tolerance was uh, uh, started by Trump and um, it ignores the uh, threat of the gangs in the upper left and practices instead intentional cruelty by seizing and jailing children apart from their parents. They can, and uh, putting them in these concentration camps. So there's an uh, example of the kids behind bars. I think uh, Alexandria uh, Ortega Cortez uh, took that picture. And uh, so here's an example of um, how, you know, the spaces and the, where the wall's been built and where it hasn't, you know. Uh, but like I said, even where it's built, it really doesn't make all that much difference. Um, one thing to take note of is over here on the on the um, left, you see, this is one particular section of wall where a lot of people have died. So what they've done on the Mexican side is they put up these crosses. Uh, any of you who've gone to the School of the Americas protest will recognize this. This is what we do. We, put, we march with the names on the crosses and put them on the gates of uh, Fort Benning. So... And here's the pic a famous picture of the father and his daughter. Uh, they were uh, both deported and they tried to swim back across the Rio Grande and they both died. So this is, um, this is where we're uh, coming to be. And uh, you start to see the kind of um, logic or the fascist logic, I should say, to Trump's policy. It's not that the, the cruelty is incidental or a byproduct. The cruelty is the intention. Um, so one thing that needs to be noted about why all these poor Hondurans are coming to the United States now to begin with. A lot of you may know, but a lot of Americans don't know, is that there was a relatively progressive government in Honduras, but it was over. It was defeated in a coup d'état, based mainly uh, backed by Hillary, who uh, was eventually backed by Obama too. She dra she drug him into it, but in the final analysis, the buck stopped with him. Uh, it was because of so you had a right wing government that was uh, backed by gang <laughs> drug gangs and all kinds of the worst elements, causing all sorts of misery. Uh, you'd have a, gangsters in your neighborhood show up and say, give us your 12-year-old daughter, and we're going to use her as a prostitute, and if you don't, we'll kill your 10-year-old son. So under conditions like that, uh, people find uh, ways to flee as fast as they can. It's not like they didn't have some encouragement. One thing that's gone on, and this is, has shows the, with this map down here, these uh, striped areas here are the areas of most severe drought, mainly in Honduras. And here's some of the pictures of it. Here's the cornfields not able to grow, and there are cattle dying. 
uh, because of the drought. So climate change, uh, this four year long drought is unheard of in the region, uh, but it's a, you know, it's a feature of climate change. It's in addition, if it's not the, uh, if it's not the terror of the gangs forcing you to flee, you have this kind of, uh, the fact that you're, you're, you may well starve to death, also leading to desperation. And so uh, you have a picture here, you know, people, you know, young kids, and here's a pregnant woman, they're just basically trying to scavenge, scavenge for food out of a, um, out of a dump, trying to try and stay alive. Oh, uh, and this is the, uh, you know, most uh, uh, the religious workers and others have gone to the border to work with the uh, with the asylum Hondurans and uh, Guatemalans asylum seekers. Uh, this is the story that you hear from them here. That by far the vast majority. This is uh, why uh, they deservedly uh, need to be treated as. Uh, asylum seekers and not just, you know, uh, you know, a low income Mexican American worker looking for work to, uh, so he can feed his family. So to conclude, one thing the book does is it shows us how the past is still alive on the border. The things that uh, have are distant from our memory as Americans, or they were never part of our memory to begin with, are not distant from the memories of Mexicans. Here's a picture of, up above of when uh, President Wilson in 1916 intervened militarily to teach Mexico a lesson. There's uh, General Pershing soldiers going in. This uh, map up here in the upper left, this is the uh, uh, a map of uh, Mexico. Uh, before um, um, Polk, President Polk decided to go, go to war with Mexico. The uh, border previously was uh, up along here, away from the Rio, about 100 miles north of the Mio, Rio Grande. But Polk just arbitrarily said, okay, the, the real borders of Rio Grande, and he sent and any Mexican troops which were there, which, and then there were some because they were in their own country. He said they were invading the U.S. and as a result of self-defense, uh, he was sending American soldiers to kill them. And that's how the Mexican War started, and he, he blamed it. In, by, redraw, by drawing a new line on the map, he, he declared all the Mexicans their invaders, and that was his excuse. And if you can see by the size of Mexico at the time and how where it is now, you can see how basically the northern half of Mexico uh, was uh, stolen. Uh, supposedly by the final treaty, uh, Mexico was supposed to get $5 million for it, but they never saw a penny of it. Um, so one result of this, uh, the Mexican Americans, I mean, Mexicans have always been in the less, uh, Western US, but the recent growth has changed the politics somewhat. And you begin to see it here. This map here is from, uh, uh, from um, 1980, uh, the one on the left showing the density, the, the darkest shades are uh, over 50%, you know, uh, near 100%. And this is, and you can see just how much it's changed in, uh, this is 2006, and there's a concentration of Mexican uh, or Latino. There's a distinction made between Mexican Americans and Mexicans who basically cross the border and people who lived here before uh, when uh, it was seized, and um, those are uh, sometimes called Chicano, and uh, there's this distinction between a Mexican and Chicano. And there's some some, uh, some left groups have made this distinction, say, and they make the point that this is what they call Aslan, uh, or the uh, Chicano nation that exists uh, within the United States, uh, and uh, as such has a, a kind of right of self-determination. Not necessarily that they necessarily want to break it off and rejoin Mexico, but they do want uh, fighting for different degrees of autonomy and, and political power and a part of, uh, you know, the, as you can see, the concentrated masses of, uh, of um, uh, Spanish-speaking people. So the border deaths 
occur within a context, this kind of political context. And um, um, you have the angels of the desert uh, still working to, to try and help people out. But there's still a considerable degree of, um, of uh, hostility and chauvinism uh, towards these people. The last thing, uh, you know, for people who really want to take a look at uh, some of the even uh, further history of this, I highly recommend this book shown up here by uh, Amy Greenberg, um, uh, A Wicked War. And it's basically it's a, a history of the uh, Mexican-American War, but it's told from the point of view of the mass anti-war movement that existed in the United States uh, during the Mexican War. Uh, it didn't start immediately with the with the invasion, but it grew, uh, and it grew somewhat rapidly uh, to be a, a huge major, um, a major protest movement, major insurrection. Uh, that basically, uh, uh, Polk's original idea was to take all of Mexico, but it basically forced him to, you know, to stop it at the, you know, uh, the you know the borderline that we know today and and to negotiate a quicker end to it. It's because of that huge upsurge. So that's it. That's basically the background. Um, so um, I hope you learn something from it and uh, yeah. find it useful. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, yeah very good. Thank you. Carl, Carl. Carl, I have a question. This was an excellent discussion. Thank you so much. A um, lot of background. I'm wondering whether Frey, uh, you know, uh, right around the time uh, the U.S. invaded Mexico, uh, the um, Southerners were trying to expand slavery to the West. Exactly. Does he discuss whether that was part, partly what was behind? Yeah, yeah. it was definitely part of, part of what was behind uh, the annexation of Texas. And... Uh, because uh, the the whites Americans that were in Texas want, wanted took their slaves there. That's they wanted for slave territory, and Mexico, who they uh, Texas was rebelling against, was was anti-slavery. They had come out for abolition. Uh, <coughs> so uh, um, the um, annexation of Texas was very much part of the pro-slavery cause. Afterwards. Uh, the uh, decisions of the new territories uh, won by the Mexican War and the, uh, also the, uh, the question of Oregon were decided somewhat differently. Uh, the South wanted to, uh, uh, to be, you know, and Calhoun argued for the states to uh, be open to slavery all the way to California and, uh, and Oregon too. Uh, he wasn't so much concerned about Oregon because Oregon wasn't very good for growing cotton. Uh, but he definitely wanted to uh, New Mexico and California to be safe. California itself uh, managed through its elites to vote to become a free state and, uh, and did so in part to keep some of the balance between slave and free states prior to the Civil War. But uh, you could really uh, see this, and Calhoun argued it, that, you know, if slavery was kept confined to the southern states itself, and he knew that it would die because the uh, uh, slave plantations or methods of uh, farming were destroying the land, and the only way they could, the only way the slave system could, ex could survive was to find uh, newer lands that uh, uh, were not yet destroyed to the west, while the slave plantations back to the east in places like Virginia and the Carolinas, they would be breeder farms. Uh, they wouldn't produce uh, cotton or tobacco so much as they would produce new slaves uh, that could then be sold down the river, that was the phrase, uh, to where the harsher uh, work, work your slave to death in five years and then buy, him, buy another one to replace him. Uh, a policy was uh, more or less taken out. And so that they wanted to extend into East Texas as well. In fact, um, during one of the cotton crises of, uh, you know, the antebellum South, there was a period when all these uh, cotton plantations were going broke and they couldn't meet their debts. So what they did is 
you know, their debt collectors would come around to the plantation to collect their debt, and they would find a big sign on the plantation, gone to Texas, because at that time, Texas was still not part of the union, and they couldn't go there uh, to collect their debts, but at the same time, the planters could take their slaves with them and, and plant cotton and continue to plant cotton and escape their old debts. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Carl, would you go over for me uh, something that, that I missed? There's a period where Mexican labor is in great demand. Yes through the Bracero program, right. and presumably that continues, right? Our people of Mexican descent still predominate in the agricultural sector. Right. But and they, what generates then the, uh, the shift to restrict immigration? Well, the return of, the return of um, GIs uh, and the... Uh, Going back to you know to the states where they come from, the influx of returning GIs meant that there was a greater pressure on the labor market, and so um, Mexicans who were not simply braceros but who worked in other parts of industry had to be pushed back. Uh, uh, they still needed a certain number to do the uh, work on the the harder work on the farms that that the American laborers wouldn't do. But plenty of the other work that Americans would do were, were now uh, it, are now being uh, those jobs are returning to American GIs who were returning from the war. So they had an excess of several about a million or so uh, laborers that they they sent uh, Eisenhower sent them back to Mexico. Okay, and by the eighties, what there's a declining demand for agricultural labor. Or some combination of well, with, with Reagan, Reagan, Reagan uh, understood the ongoing need for uh, agribusiness for uh, Mexican labor, cheap labor in Mexico, uh, both, uh, you know, just to get the work done and also as a way of fighting the farm workers union. So he uh, made a point of uh, he wanted to normalize it so much, which is why he he uh, he uh, gave amnesty to three million. And uh, but at the same time, try to place stricter regulations on uh, those uh, who are still crossing the border temporarily. Uh, so Reagan wanted to, you know, wanted to legalize the ones that were here and ha and have a stricter regulation of those who were still coming across the border. But basically, he took the point of view of agribusiness. He wanted a regulated labor supply of cheap labor okay. that he could move back and forth. Uh, the position that uh, Trump and them are taking these days is uh, basically um, it's not a position that uh, is favored by a lot of Republican agribusiness uh, who, are, who are still, you know, they, st they still understand the need for, for Mexican labor, even though Trump uses the, you know, the propaganda that these people are stealing American jobs. They're really not. They're stealing, they, they just take the jobs that American labor is not uh, either won't do or don't know how to do. Uh, you know, after several generations of, of being away from working the farms in the South, uh, uh, African Americans who live in the cities really have no idea how to work a farm, work on a farm. And uh, maybe their grandparents do, but they don't. And uh, so, whereas, you know, just about any Mexican that comes up from Mexico is very familiar with farm work and is uh, able to do it. It's really, it's really, it's one argument I make with people, you know, when they talk about all the, the fences and, and the guards and whatnot. I said, look, it's basically an economic problem. Migration on this scale is really an economic problem. And the only solutions to it are economic. You know, you have to do away with the uh, uh, differential and conditions between the global north and the global south. You have to stop dumping uh, you know, we claim about China, China dumping Chinese steel on the American markets, but here we do the same thing. We dump our corn in the Mexican mm -hmm. market. So uh, we have to put an end to dumping. Uh, and there's all sorts of things you have to do that, but they're, they're not sexy, you know. They're, they're, these kind of solutions are long range. You know, you have to raise, raise the labor standards of, on both sides of the border and things like this. Right. Uh, uh, it was, oh, what, what was so insidious about NAFTA 
exactly. So, um, but uh, so now they think that they have an administrative solution for every economic problem, and they don't, they don't really work. They just make things more miserable. It's like a, it's mm-hmm. like a, it's like the war on drugs. You know, the war on the war on drugs has made things uh, 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 has benefited the uh, the people who own and supply jails, the prison industrial complex, and they and by keeping drugs illegal. Uh, it, it keeps the price up and it benefits the suppliers of narcotics. So, so administrative efforts to solve economic and social problems are not are uh, less than useless. They make matters worse. Very good, Carl. Okay. Well, um, I. Chairman Mao always says it's good to keep meetings short. <laughs> so <laughs> there's no there's no reason for us to keep on anymore. So thanks a lot for listening to me. And uh, if you have any place uh, where you want to show this, you can uh, since we'll have it recorded, you can just run the recording. Or if you can get a group of people together, you know, enough people together, so uh, uh, I'll be glad to do it again over Zoom. If uh, if you have a uh, if you give me a, a classroom full of students, I'll be glad to do it again. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Janet, before Thank you go, 